Good morning, everybody. I'm Jam. And I'm Neka. And we are part of the Professionals Ministry in the Greater Richmond Church of Christ's South Region. We're very, very, very happy to have you joining us this morning. Yeah, we're super excited for today's message as Gabe teaches about thankfulness from the book of Colossians. And we all know how important it is to be thankful as we worship King Jesus, which is actually our theme for the year as a church. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to go ahead and pray for the service for the rest of the day and just for God's will to be done. Mm -hmm. Holy Father, thank you for just being our king. Thank you for being better than any president we could vote for. Thank you for being better than any role model we could uh, hope to hope to aspire to, hope to be like, hope to emulate. Um, thank you for being better than what our idea of best is on this earth. Honestly, mm -hmm. you're, you're perfect. You're literally perfect. Thank you for that. Um, thank you that you're worthy of being worshiped. Mm -hmm. um, gosh, just, just thank you so much, Lord. Um, your name is just so sweet. You're so sweet to us. Um, you're lovely, you're, you're everything, Lord. Um, I pray for the rest of um, this service. We really just got started, but I pray that you know, you're with the worship. I pray that you're with uh, the message that Gabe's gonna preach. I pray that you're with us as we listen um, to the words that Gabe's gonna preach to us. Um, really, he's just preaching out of his heart. He's trying to preach your heart to us, Lord. I pray that we are humble to hear what he's saying. Um, and yeah, that we take it to heart and don't just, you know, hear it and then, you know, go on about our day as if we didn't hear it, you know, and just forget what we heard, but really put into practice the things that he's talking about, Lord. Um, again, thank you for being uh, just our our first love, you know, um, truly. Thank you for being our first love, our greatest love, um, our greatest uh, protector, uh, our, our greatest provider. Um, thank you for being our everything. Um, yeah, I just pray that your will is done and that we are happy to do your will each and every day. In Christ's holy name, amen. Amen. Um, we hope you enjoy service, and we can't wait to see all of you all in person. Mm -hmm. Hello. My name is Anthony Lawrence, and you don't know me, and I likely don't know you. But I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. Now, I wasn't always like this, of course, but the journey that I took to get there was rather revealing. Growing up in Amber, Pennsylvania, I went to church twice a month, at least, my mom told me. Growing up going to church, I knew that God was there for me. I knew the lessons that God taught. I knew some of the lessons of the Bible, but I was missing that deep connection, that genuine connection that we need to have with God every day. I was also missing many of the lessons that were in the church. You know, sometimes I would fall asleep. I remember that when I was younger. It was just way too long and drawn out. Um, but growing up, I took notes, but I never really adhered to those notes, never really understood those notes, never really dive deep into who God, who and what God is. And so when I really got to college, I realized that as a first generation college student, there's a lot of opportunity for me. I got into as many things as I could, getting busy really fast, becoming what is called as a super first year. Um, and so throughout that entire process, I was busy, didn't make time for God, didn't focus on God, went to church maybe once that year. Um, and I really wouldn't have gone if it wasn't for the girlfriend that I had. Um, but that's a different story. And so after my first year of college, I come back home and I have this revelation. It's kind of like a coming of age type of click. And my mind said, my spirit said, you need to get closer to God. And I felt that. And at first I was kind of reacting to that. But when I got back to school, immediately I got busy again. And there were times where I would just not put God in my schedule. And so the things really started changing when I met Caleb Brooks, who goes to the University of Richmond as well. When I met him, I really kind of shifted my mind toward God for more God focused. I went to Bible talks. I went to church more. Um, and although I've never stepped foot in Greater Richmond Church of Christ yet, um, due to the pandemic, I am certainly excited to get there, get back to there. Um, and so one of the things that Caleb taught me that popped out during my studies was the lessons of repentance. Growing up, I knew about repentance, you know, repent from your sins and, you know, you'll be given salvation, the sinner's prayer. But I never knew what really went into that. I never knew the type of heart that you had to have to repent. And so that was one of the greatest lessons that he's taught me is that repentance is an action and repentance is a continual thing, um, as well as baptism is an action of obedience from your faith. And so 
I think that one of the main and greatest things that came of studying with Caleb was that lesson, but I also got to meet so many other Christian believers, Brandon and Darius and all the other people who are in the ministry. And so when I think about my journey, I think that it wouldn't have been able to be done without them. Um, it wouldn't have been able to be done without Caleb sitting me down and saying, all right, let's study this out or let's do this. And so the reason that I chose to get baptized, although albeit during quarantine, um, was not an easy decision. When I decided saying yes, you know, there were also things on the other side saying no. My family, for instance, wanting me to get baptized in a church traditionally um, versus me taking it into my own sand, taking it into my own hands. Ultimately, I kind of combined the two. I invited family while also taking it into my own hands and being safe at my own home, buying my own kiddie pool uh, that I fit in, of course, and getting baptized that way. And I got baptized by Darius and it was a great day and it was a great time. And it was such an amazing experience just to see how people can come together. And so far, the spirit has been working within me, coming up with ideas about how to transform the ministry at Richmond, how to continue to go out in the in the crowd and in this world that is so lost and just heal it or bring some type of healing to it. You know, I, I really have faith in the Great Commission. I have faith in God. And I can't thank Caleb enough or Brandon enough or Darius enough or the people around me enough, especially Greater Richmond Church of Christ, um, for bringing the resources to light and bringing and being able and allowing me to see how great God is. Um, and so that's pretty much my testimony. Again, my name is Anthony Lawrence. I go to University of Richmond, and it was very nice meeting you. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of Till I met you well, I was breathing but not alive And all my failures I tried to hide It was my doom Till I met you you called my name And I ran out of that grave
Good morning, church. My name is Dominic Wall, and I'm here with my beautiful, awesome, amazing wife, Jessica Wall. And uh, we have the honor and privilege to prepare you guys for contribution this morning. I uh, hope you're having a good service, worship service uh, so far. Uh, so let's jump right into it. Uh, I've chosen to share 2 Corinthians 2. I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians 8. Uh, verses 10 through 12. I'm going to go and read that. It says, And here is my judgment about what is best for you in this matter. Last year you were the first not only to give, but also to have the desire to do so. Now finish the work so that your eager willingness to do it may be matched by your completion of it according to your means. For if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. Um, and that like that passage really uh, hit my heart differently uh, reading it and preparing um, because I uh, up until this point, uh, I've been I'm definitely a person that's really concerned with what I don't have. Like my mind is like 90 percent set on what don't I have? what do I need to replenish? Mm -hmm. Like, is there food? We don't have food. Let's get that. Uh, we don't have, I guess, security from our bill collectors. Let's pay them. Um, let's, you know, I don't have gas on my car. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't. Uh, and this passage clearly uh, instructs us. Paul teaches us to, um, you know, to, to finish the job that the willingness uh, in us started and to be more concerned with what you do have rather than what you don't. Uh, and that's a huge, huge message that, um, you know, out of our wealth, we can be giving. Uh, out of our uh, poverty, we can be giving. Um, that's something that uh, I would say was a huge game changer for me. Uh, the more I started to see like, hey, I do have this to give, and that's what I'm going to give, uh, was much better about you know, oh, I don't have a hundred dollars to give, so I'm just not going to give it all. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just awesome to see Paul to have this type of charge and to have this type of heart. Um, now I'm going to let Jessica share. Yeah, I think reading the scripture, there's certain words that really like stick out to my mind of like the idea of desiring or eager willingness um, and to continue the works. It's like thinking back when I first got baptized, like gaining convictions on giving to begin with was so different than it is now. Like I was just so excited and on it, like there's so much zeal there and you're just like excited to be God's kingdom and wanting to help and like be a part of that in any way. Mm -hmm. But as years go on and life changes, being from single now to married, you just like finances start to like weigh on you and you think of like all of the to-do list. I think of like, you know, just like Dom said, like uh, food and bills and just like, you know, security of like, oh, like we need to put this money away. But it's so like amazing to see the scriptures does spell out. It's like, you know, keeping that eagerness. It's like, do I like, do I have willingness, but do I have eager willingness to want to provide for the church and like thinking of even mm. the future of like, you know, of what we can do with it and what God's already accomplished with this. Right. Um, it's just such an amazing impact. So I'm just really grateful to just keep this time to remember the reason we want to be eager and willing to be able to be participants with God in this endeavor. Amen. Yeah. So church, please uh, I, I pray that you contemplate that. I pray that you allow that to really sink into your heart that uh, it's about what God has blessed you with. Um, everyone has a role to play. Everyone has something to give. Um, and everyone's been, been blessed to be a part of God's mission. And he wants us to be. Uh, so I pray that you can set your minds on what uh, you do have rather than what you don't. Uh, I'm going to pray and then we'll get on with our service. Uh, Father God, we just want to thank you so much, God, for your word, uh, God, and how it instructs us, it teach, teaches us. Uh, God, we thank you so much for being concerned what we do have, God, rather than what we don't. Uh, God, and me personally, I can be so wrapped up, Father, with uh, the things that you haven't blessed me with yet, 
or the the attributes that I that I don't have or what I can't do, God. But you're you're a God of can do, uh, God, and you um, just bless us so much, God. And we have so much to give, God. And I pray that uh, we can turn our minds and, and let it be set on what we can do and what we can give and the things that um, the things that come from it, God. I pray that it's awesome. God, and I pray that, uh, the, you know, the, the contribution can go to the needs of the church. Everything can be met even amongst COVID. God, uh, even as, you know, things have been kind of crazy. God, I pray that we can still give in a mighty way, God, as we have been, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
Hello, brothers and sisters, and welcome to this time of worship and, of course, study of God's Word. That is what we need. That is what we most need in many ways to eat, to ingest, to have nourish our lives um, every day, and certainly on the day of the Lord uh, when we gather together to worship. Um, it is, of course, a joy to continue this series on the Epistle to the Gal Colossians uh, from Paul. And Colossians. Um, we had already had a great introduction from Tony last week with the opening thanksgiving of Paul, which he then moves to another, uh, another uh, type of prayer, an intercession um, for the Colossians. This intercessory prayer runs from verse 9 to 14. It is one Greek sentence, one long one, very long, with a lot of very, very substantial, right, uh, terms that say a whole lot if even you were only focused on one clause of that sentence. We're actually going to just simply glean some important points from six of these verses, 9 through 14, basically the entire sentence. I didn't want to break it up because in many ways uh, that would of course break uh, the thought that they could say the great insight that Paul wanted to pass on, the blessing he wanted to pass on to them. So let's go ahead and begin there in verses 9 to 14. At the end, we'll pray, we'll bring all this to communion, um, and uh, then be built up in our life ready for faithful action. Uh, in verse 9 of Colossians uh, 1, it reads there, For this reason also, since the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, to please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, for the attaining of all steadfastness and patience, joyously giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. For he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Last week, Tony, of course, preached on the beginning of this epistle, and it was about thanksgiving. It was about, in some cases here, just a few reasons for why we ought to be thankful. Right? The fruitful impact of the gospel, the hope that has been laid up for us, those among many other things, but those are the two um, that we focused on last week, are a cause for great thanksgiving. In verse 9 to 14, man, Paul just multiplies stuff. It's like an avalanche of blessing. <laughs> you wonder, man, he could have just mentioned a couple of those things and it would have been enough, but he certainly brings it. It is almost like some of the Psalms that we were reading last week. And so in this case, he says, he actually begins in verse 9, for this reason, because of everything that I just said about hope, about the impact of the gospel, about all this news that Epaphras, which is the, the, the fellow worker in the Lord that he mentions, because of that news that he brought to me from you, I'm going to let you know that I'm constantly praying for you. He says, I have not ceased praying for you to be filled with the knowledge of God's will. And the way that the clause is written, more than anything expresses, I want you to be filled with the knowledge of God's will through spiritual wisdom and understanding. That is, spiritual wisdom and understanding 
is the foundation. That's the prerequisite. You know what I mean? If you think of it like these, this coursework that we take in, at school, right? Spiritual wisdom and understanding are needed in order to find out what God's will is. So Paul wasn't just thankful for the Colossians, but he also constantly interceded for them. What a tremendous challenge that is. I mean, I believe, for example, my wife, she's very good at intercessory prayer. So if any of you are ever wondering whether they're praying for you, especially here in the South, you can pretty much bet my wife prays for you. But intercession is something that all of us, right? And many of us do excel in, but that all of us, imagine, are constantly doing for others. And he says, I constantly intercede for you all. Right? I want all kinds of good and godly things in your life. Ask yourself about what is constant in your prayer life. Are you constantly thanking God and interceding for your fellow brothers and sisters and neighbors? I honestly, I can often feel more urgency, maybe a deeper pain, right, of, uh, or a deeper passion for my requests, for what I would like, even for me and for my own clarity. But what about the way that he puts it here for others? I mean, the way that he lays it out, he says, man, I constantly intercede for you. I go and I stand in whatever gap there is to stand on between you and others. Man, that is awesome. And many of us, actually all of us, have been blessed by the fact that someone went and stood in between God and us and prayed that we would be helped, that we would be healed, that our eyes would be open to see something very, very important, that we would do something for somebody else that would really lift them up and show them God's love or God's faithfulness or God's right joy for them or delight or even God's own hurt and pain and maybe even anger. Right? We all need to intercede. No one here has direct access, right, um, right, to some other person, right? We don't even pray to God, right? We pray to God uh, that is just by the, our own power to reach, but we pray in the name of Christ. Someone is standing there interceding for us, right? We even know that the Holy Spirit intercedes for us, as it says in Romans, right? Here, he says, man, we need intercession, and Paul lives, he says, constantly interceding for these others, now that is a heart that goes out to others. That is a Christ-like heart. That is the one that is great to already, right off the bat, pick up and store away. And it says, in other words, right? He says, by means, by means of wisdom, spiritual wisdom, we will learn about God's will. If there is anything with which we would want to be filled, God's will probably tops the list, right? I mean, I can think of all the things that I would like to be filled with in terms of knowledge. I mean, maybe one of us, maybe, we could be, maybe we're feeling a little more modest, right? He says, I would just like to have memorized an entire instruction manual so I don't have to constantly refer to it. <laughs> I, I, I already got it in and I know what to do. Imagine being filled with the knowledge of how to fix all the appliances in your kitchen or any mechanical device in the home that would be a worthwhile thing to be filled with, right? Or, or maybe one of us, right, could think, uh, I'd like to have comprehensive knowledge of all of my work tasks so that I always know what to do in every situation at work. All of those are great, and I'll admit that. But do any of these actually compare to the knowledge of God's will? Imagine that. We are offered, in fact, we are given the knowledge of God's very desires. God, our creator. We're privy to God's own heart. Now, we don't go in there and take it out of him. It's, of course, donated to us. It's self-revealed. God gives his own heart and life to us. He reveals it to us. That's one of the reasons why we have the Bible. That's one of the reasons why we have, right, and are offered the Spirit. But, I mean, the clause says that, in verse 10, it says, Man, we're given this knowledge so that we may please God in all respects, right? In every way we could please God. So imagine 
What is better than that? If I know God's will, that means I can walk in tandem with God in the world. I can participate in His will. My will, what I most earnestly desire in my heart, has to answer to God's will. Now, in our world, this world that we live in, we know that the default is, what do you want? Express yourself. What do you want to do? Right? Think of the thing that you most desire right now. The thing that you would want to come to pass more than anything else. Where is God's will in it? Is God having to answer to it or is it having to answer to God? Am I bending God's will into mine or is mine decentered and God is placed there? Right? Where is God's will in my desire? You know, earlier this week, I had a conversation with uh, a brother who was telling me about the number of things, the efforts that, and, and the hard work that he's putting in to contributing in some way to conversations about right, racial harm um, right, or, 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 and, and ethnic healing in our community of Richmond. And after he told me about right, the different things that they had been working on, he then qualified all of it with, but we want to know what God's doing. We want to know what God thinks about all this stuff. And we're going to talk about that. And I appreciated that so much, right? Because of course, at this, when, I'm, when I'm trying to make things happen, I feel like I'm at the center of my actions. But he said, you know, we want to know what God wants. We want to know what God feels. We want to know what God is doing. And I admit that often when I'm talking knowledge of God's will with myself, even with others, it's often qualified with for my life, right? How many times have we heard that? I'm seeking after God's knowledge, uh, that is God's will for my life. So even that is somehow turned inward. Somehow even that is turned toward me. How about just what is God's will <laughs> for this whole city, for this neighborhood, for this other one? And often I'll assume, oh, I, th I already know it. God wants what's best for them. God wants to bless them. God wants to save them. You know what I mean? God wants to snatch them and take the shackles off of sin. But how much time do I actually spend relishing that will, seeking it, wanting to know it? This week, let us be forthright and repentant about seeking God's will for our neighborhood or city, for our workplace. Let's say to ourselves, God I want to be the servant of your will. When we converse with anybody, what is God seeking here? Especially if we're talking to a brother or sister, especially in seeking spiritual wisdom, if we don't know what spiritual wisdom there is in that situation, it's not coming to us, that should be the thing that we're seeking after most adamantly. Not just what, what do they think about this? What do you think about me? Certainly, not. what do I think about them? What did I say to them? How do I respond? No, what is God's will here? What is the spiritually wise thing? What is the spirit of God moving to do? What do I know? And if I don't know that, maybe some of us know, I don't even know that. Then it's time to go to scripture. It's time to pray. It's time to ask others to read scripture and pray with you. <laughs> That's that we have so much at our disposal. It's time to go back in the memory. What, what have I learned about God's will in this situation? The result of being filled with the knowledge of God's will, as it says, as we move on, is, my goodness, it's at least fourfold. Leading a life worthy of the Lord, pleasing in all respects. We already talked about that. Bearing fruit in good works. Increasing in the knowledge of God. And then there's this power for resilience and patience. In my version, which is the NASB, it said steadfastness and patience in verse 11. Now, it makes sense that I'm, when I'm filled with the knowledge of God's will and I'm actively doing it, that is, I'm living into it, I'm going to learn more about who God is. He says, I'll increase in the knowledge of God. But let's focus for a moment on a couple of those things. He talks about fruit 
and this kind of steadfastness, this resilience, this patience. Good fruit will come, right, from these actions. Or I should say, this fruit will come from these good works. Regarding fruit from good works, think about that for a moment. I suspect we are in a situation right now where we're doubting the fruit of good work, right? I know I am. Many of us, whether it's in situations for the coronavirus, are we doing anything that's actually making a difference? Or maybe even in the case of right, racism and racial harm, are we talking about, or are all these things actually bringing about needed change in the areas where the change is needed? We may be suspecting that. We may even be suspecting our own contribution and impact. I know I am. Every week I'm asking myself, is this really having an impact? Am I really helping somebody else? Am I letting myself be helped? What is going on here? Am I taking steps to be more Christ-like in this situation? And when I am, where's the fruit of it? How come I don't feel as patient this week <laughs> after praying about it? Or how come I feel more frustrated rather than less? And we could be going around in these kinds of circles here, when we read this passage, right, he's, I think he's actually directing them to know, man, you have something amazing being given to you from God. You have already been served up. <laughs> you know, the good, he says, I want you to be so filled up with God's love that you'll, you, there, there won't be an alternative, right? I mean, you will know that when I do a good work, I'll be like planting seeds and watering them. And what typically happens to a good seed? It will grow. It will grow. And it will continue to grow if it's allowed to continue to grow. And it will, by design, bear fruit. It will happen. It's kind of remarkable how this echoes Galatians 6. Keep sowing seeds to the Spirit as opposed to the flesh. And don't grow weary in doing good, because then you will reap a harvest. This thing is pretty much said, right? It follows bearing fruit and good works with steadfastness and patience. Those two go together, man. We know we've got to continue to do that. I think right now, many of us are discouraging each other more often than we're encouraging each other. It's time to get out of ourselves, brothers and sisters. It's time to get out into that spirit and, and, and ask the spirit for courage. For courage to build each other up. Some of us are, are probably more discouraged from things that just conversations or exchanges we're having on social media or other conversations than anything else. That's not the spirit that we've got, brothers and sisters. We've got a spirit, it says here, that it will continue to do good work and it will bear good fruit. It will produce something. Paul is convinced of it. This wasn't for show. This wasn't for a nice little inspirational pep talk. This is for him reality, and it's time to embrace reality, right? All of the talk and chatter and rhetoric, especially when it comes to some of the political infighting, right? And others, man, they're fight it's fighting amongst each other without reference to the king kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God is actually the, mo the realest thing in town. It's the one that will work its way in. It doesn't do it according to the games, right? According to the rules of the worldly game, though. It does it in all the ways that we've already been preaching about in the past few weeks. But let's take a look at that. If we are steadfast, if we are patient in doing what is good, what we know is good from Christ, it will bear fruit. And it's so great to have these words here. In God's good name, brothers and sisters, let's lift each other up. We're planting seeds and watering seeds, and they'll bear good fruit. That's the way plants work. That's the way good works also work. Right? We have an opportunity right now to grow deeper roots of our faith than in many, many, many years. For many of us, that's the case. For others that have faced challenges, perhaps not. Right? Of certain kinds, but this is an opportunity we can seize. We can get through the pandemic period with a stronger faith, ready to face challenges that we never have before for the sake of our brothers and sisters and neighbors. And again, it's not about me. It's about God's will. It's about others.
You know what I mean? And so if we seize that opportunity, it will result in joyful thanksgiving. How Paul started this is also how he ends this sentence. Right? He said, right? And that, I mean, he's, he's extremely joyful, you can say. He says, if we have all, if we can attain steadfastness and patience, we're joyously giving thanks to the Father, that's verse 12, who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. For he has rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He says, this is what has happened. It's not a prospective sort of thing. It's not, it may happen. It's happened. That's why he can give joyful thanks. Brothers and sisters, let's bring out that joy and thanks. That joy and thanks that comes from repentance, that comes from lifting others up. Right? He says he thanks him here that we've been qualified, we've been delivered, and we've been transferred. I mean, there are so many things that Paul happens to pack in some of these right, passages. It's honestly too much. We've been delivered from darkness to the reign of God's Son. Just like we've talked about in previous weeks, we end in many ways the same way. We have been delivered. We have cause for joy. That's not some fake plastic joy. That's not a superficial one. Man, I read this and I'm ready, man. This week, I, I want to view, especially for us, let's just think of the month of August. Of one, each day we're going to think, I'm going to continue to do what is good. I'm going to continue to lift people up. I am going right, to make sure that I am most adamant about finding and sticking to God's will. And that's certainly not in a hateful spirit, but one that remembers Jesus on the cross. I expend my life for the sake of others. Because I know that God will give. I know that I can learn to receive and that is the greatest gift. That is what we have in Christ on the cross. That is where he defeated these powers of darkness from which we are delivered. It says we've, we've been redeemed. That is the ransom payment to release us from slavery has been, has been paid. So if we're a free people, of what can we possibly be afraid? Who can take away that freedom? Nobody. Who can take away that joy? Nobody. It is what you and I and all God's people and all God's children who want it, seek it, accept it. It's from them and nothing can take that away. Brothers and sisters, let's be a force for the good against the powers of darkness. When Jesus was on the cross, that was his throne and there he defeated them. And when he rose from the dead, he smashed the powers of darkness. Now we have an opportunity to carry that same spirit out. We have an opportunity to, like it says here, to, man, be filled with the knowledge of God's will. Let's seek that spiritual wisdom this week. Let's pray to God now in thanksgiving for the cross that makes all of this possible. God, we thank you so much for the cross. We thank you that at this time we can actually receive this bread, this fruit of the vine, more so than anything to remember what Paul's words in Colossians seem to indicate, and, and gosh, in words that are almost stumbling over each other, that, that we have been blessed beyond our most our wildest imagination. But, but in particular, we have been called to seek your will. When Jesus went to the cross, he had to embrace your will. He had to really cling to it. And that's what we want. God, we no longer wish to be fragmented and cut up into bits and pieces, all this right, distracted, even discouraged by the, 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 the impact of our good work. We just simply want to do the good work because we know that's what you're about. We know you're about doing good in the world. And it's not even to fill yourself up, to, to, to massage your ego. It's not for that for us. It's because that's who you are. You have already filled up the world with good. You have already done amazing things. And so we want to, in reply and in return, do the same. We thank you. We praise you, God. In Jesus' name we pray all of these things. Amen. Have a great week.